recording and a couple minutes late i'm just going to go ahead and say everybody welcome to tgi the greatest indoor reading series we are here we just were figuring out beforehand we have been here for about seven months maybe entering our eighth every friday night except for once i forget why I think we were just tired. I don't I think we just planned a week off. Um, but we uh, aim our best or try our best to bring um, together writers, artists, creative people, interesting people to share their work, um, to have a discussion about it. And we'd love to see people, A, introducing themselves, networking, and B, reacting to the work that's being read in that chat window over, in my case, it's on the right, depending on your device. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But so feel free to participate there. Really quick couple housekeeping things. Um, one, we have a website. This uh, We've had it for a couple of weeks. It is a labor of, um, I'm not a labor of love. It was a labor of frustration. Uh, it is tgicast.com. Uh, if you want to go over there, you can find out all the information about the show, uh, who's coming up on it. Um, this particular night with corrected spellings now. Thank you, Michelle and Natalie. Apologies. Uh, and then um, additionally, you can find out about the podcast I've been doing where I've been interviewing people, um, which is just, I think, a very interesting, um, you know, thing to do, get inside people's heads, right? Because for me, as a person who is not necessarily a writer myself, or I don't identify as one, it's really interesting to get into people's processes and the personal reasons behind the amount of work that they do because everybody who is invested in some form of art does a tremendous amount of work to pursue it while also attending to you know the rest of life right uh so um i've been trying i've been saying this every week for like a month and a half i've been trying to say the word ado less so without further foofaraw I would like to introduce our first reader. Uh, Courtney LeBlanc is the author of Beautiful and Full of Monsters from, and this is one of the greatest press names I've ever read, Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, Chapbooks All in the Family, Bottle Cap Press, and The Violence Within, Flutter Press. She has her MBA from the University of Baltimore and her MFA from Queens University of Charlotte. She loves nail polish, tattoos, and a soy latte each morning. You can read her publications on her blog which I will just say, and then maybe post it into the chat, wordperv.com. Absolutely wonderful. Without, uh, I'm not even going to say ado or foo for all. Courtney, you can unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. Well, not everyone. Thank you, Trina and Ridge, for organizing this and inviting me to come on tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my new book, Beautiful and Full of Monsters. Um, it actually came out the week the pandemic rocked the world. So it is very interesting to launch a book during these times. I had my book tour, all my readings, my launch party, everything canceled. So I'm really grateful to people who host these readings um, because it's a great way to connect with other you know, creative people and other writers. Um, and because of this, people like my friend Paula, who's online in New Zealand, gets to hear me read, and normally, obviously, that wouldn't be the case. So the first poem I'm going to read from my book is titled Cut. First, I cut off my hands so I couldn't touch him, couldn't hold him. When this wasn't enough, I cut off my ears so I couldn't hear him whisper, good morning, beautiful. Next, I cut off my lips, my tongue, removed my ability to kiss him, to hold his name in my mouth. When none of these helped, when I still felt the dull ache for him, when he still haunted my dreams, I finally plunged the blade into my chest and cut out my heart. A glistening, wet muscle that echoed his name with each beat. It pounded wildly and then stopped, shuddered to silence, his name finally cut from me. Uh, the next poem is titled Guilty. I look like an unloved wife. Brilliant diamonds circle my finger, promise vows my heart is still trying to keep. In hotel bars, men buy me drinks and hope for a night between my thighs. Sometimes I let them 
lean close, fingers grazing my warm skin. My lips brush their cheek before telling them no. I leave with only their names clutched between my teeth, go to bed naked but alone, feel guilty for crimes I've not yet committed. The next poem is titled Break. We were standing in my kitchen, close, and I could almost feel your breath against my breath. Neither of us moved, my hand frozen in the air halfway between us, hesitating. The moment shattered when the wine bottle slipped from my other hand, glass and red grenading across the tile. You stepped back carefully, reached for a towel, began cleaning up. I stood stock still, the shards glittering against my bare feet as you gently wiped the glass from my skin, each touch a reminder of how we could break one another. And the last one I'm gonna read from the book is titled Legend. You lie sleeping beside me, arm heavy across my body, breathing steady, a Japanese legend says, if you can't sleep, it's because you're awake in someone else's dream. I wonder if it's your dream that holds me captive. If we're together, free and happy in a way we don't exist in the waking world. I count backwards, ease into sleep, and dream of an endless hallway with dozens of doors, each an opportunity, but none contain you. Um, and then I'm going to read some newer poems, um, just because when you write a book and it eventually gets published, those poems would get really old really fast. So I wanted to share some newer stuff. This one's titled, Hunger Lectures Me. Bitch, people are legitimately starving, and there you sit with your $200 in weekly groceries in your organized pantry, the labeled containers of flour and sugar and rice, your fridge with soy milk and eggs, and two steaks thick with blood, the produce basket overflowing with mangoes and clementines and tomatoes, and you're entering every calorie into your phone, making sure you stay under the allotted daily intake. You were poor growing up, but you were farmers, so there was always the vegetables you grew, the beef you raised. Your plates were never empty, even if they lacked variety. Your mother was a boring cook, but there was always enough for all four kids. By the time you were 16, you decided, oh, excuse me. By the time you were 16, you decided the small curve of your belly was too much, your thighs too soft. Puberty added pounds, so you decided they needed to go. Decided 99 pounds was acceptable. Never mind you were running 75 miles a week, the lactis laxatives you ate like candy, belly cramping in the middle of the night as you shit out every morsel you swallowed that day. How you still flirt with this. Not the laxatives, you're too old for those games. Just record every calorie consumed, live by the mantra, you gotta burn it to earn it. Oh, shut up, you skinny bitch, and eat that brownie. It's gooey and warm and slightly undercooked, exactly the way you like it. Uh, this one's titled, <laughs> this one's titled Like That, and it's after a poem, um, I'm gonna, I always mess up her last name, by Kim Adonisio. I think that's how it's pronounced, okay. Like That. Love me like a horror film. When the virgin is stumbling through the dark in a short skirt and kitten heels, completely impractical yet anticipated. Love me like the water cascading from a waterfall, unable to stop its headlong dive over the rocky edge. Do it without asking. Swipe the salt shaker from the diner, walk out on the check. Love me like a hurricane, meteorologist predicting a path you refuse to follow. Tear up the coast and head inland. Toss the palm trees like confetti at midnight. Revel in the mess left in your wake. Do it in the only bathroom at a house party, when there's a line queued up and waiting, but I'm balanced on the edge of the sink and you're between my legs. Wrap your fist in my hair and pull me close. Watch in the mirror. Love me when it's late and the road stretches before us like taffy. 
When you're asleep in the passenger seat and the dog is asleep in the back seat and, the on and only the radio keeps me company. We'll switch and you'll drive the last three hours and I'll fight sleep but eventually nod off. And when I wake, we'll be home and we'll be happy here if you love me like that. Uh, this next one is read specifically for Paula. She asked that I read this poem. And since she's dialing in from the future of New Zealand, I'm gonna read it for her. It's titled, To My Ex Who Asked If Every Poem Was About Him. I wish you happiness, but the kind that makes you think of me after your wife has fallen asleep. I wish you 2% raises and average performance evaluations. I wish you casseroles and Bud Light. I wish you vacations to Disney World in July. I wish you khakis and plaid button-ups. I wish you sex, but only missionary position and only with the lights out. I wish you calendar reminders and capped teeth. I wish you individually wrapped low-fat cheese slices and turkey bacon, which insults two animals. I wish you mayonnaise and store-bought white bread. I wish you decaf coffee. I wish you sleeping in until 7 a.m. on Sundays. I wish you instant oatmeal microwaved each morning for your heart health. I wish you a tie each Father's Day and a birthday card received a week late. I wish you a daughter who writes poetry filled with metaphors about a complicated family relationship. I wish you a football team that never makes the playoffs and a son who's an average soccer player. I wish you this poem popping up first the next time you Google me. <laughs> uh, and the last poem I'm gonna read is, uh, it's a pandemic poem, which seems appropriate or not, I don't know, depending on your viewpoint. <laughs> it's titled Menagerie. This is the year I acquire anxiety. That donkey kicking at my chest, my brick heart thumping in response, leaving me bruised and achy and still unable to sleep. There's a gerbil in my brain running marathons on that squeaky wheel, each lap whispering a new worry for me to chew on. Who will die next? When will I find a new job? When will I be happy? As if happy is possible during a pandemic. As if the weight of living weren't crushing. Bees bumble around me, ready to drink my tears, ready to pollinate the world with anxiety. Think of the beautiful flowers that would bloom, spiky and dangerous, but their bright colors would call to the tender flesh of your fingertips, blind to the thorns that desire the iron taste of blood. There's the ostrich, its dumb head buried in the sand, trying to hide from the latest headline. The gazelle that resides in my nervous system, alert to dangers real and imagined. Is that a bug bite or cancer? Cough or COVID? WebMD says I'm likely dying. The cheetahs that hide in my feet carry me miles each morning, but still I can't, unwrap, I can't outrun this panic that smolders inside me. And what happens the day I smell smoke? The nervous fires stoked for so long they suddenly rage out of control. The animals inside me run, stampede the tender hearts that sprouted around my battered heart. Um, yep, yeah. stampede for the exit, but find it locked. Thank you. Great, right, Courtney, thank you so much. Um, I love just working backwards the the idea of anxiety as a stampede with a blocked exit is very relatable because I feel like so often, especially right now, the anxiety is almost a, a, a result of just all these other emotions that are like churning around and, and we can't do anything about it. Um, so those were relatable. I, uh, I didn't mention this up top, but I tend to respond to people just by way of like segue. And um, the thing that struck me about your work was that the, the tonal shift from, and I'm sure there are other types of poems in the, in the book, but the book felt very like alienating and, and sort of um, with a lot about relationships, but distance. And then the joy that kind of came out of, of, you know, imagining your hunger, telling you to just eat the brownie or the, the one about the ex-boyfriend particularly is genius. The, the American, um, well, 
21st century so far. We'll see how the rest goes. But uh, American middle of the road 21st century life being summed up as calendar reminders and capped teeth is like perfect. That's such a good, you know, pair of images. So that was really great. Uh, really appreciate you sharing and, and thanks so much for being here. And then also just to say, you know, we've had a, a lot of people, unfortunately, whose books came out during this and their tours were canceled. Their, you know, um, their opportunities to share their work, their, their launch parties, all this stuff. And uh, just, you know, feel really happy to be able to provide some sort of environment. So everybody, there was a link posted in the chat go pick up the book, read it, uh, and then, you know, go to wordperf.com and, and wordperf on Twitter and, and, you know, yell nice things at Courtney. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. Up next is Michelle Morano. She's the author of the memoir in essays, Like Love, and the travel memoir, Grammar Lessons, Translating a Life in Spain. Her fiction and creative nonfiction have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Essays, Fourth Genre, Brevity, Normal School, Ninth Letter, and Waveform, 21st Century Essays by Women. She's received awards and fellowships from her work, for her work from the Rona Jaffe Foundation, the American Association of University Women, the Illinois Arts Council, and the McDowell Colony, among other, others. She holds an MFA and PhD from the University of Iowa and is currently professor and chair of the English department at DePaul University in Chicago. All right, Michelle, I'm going to ask you to unmute. You should be able to do so. And Done. Take it away. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you uh, for having me as part of this really wonderful lineup. I'm super excited to be here. It's a great way to spend a Friday evening in captivity. I've been lamenting lately how um, we just don't mark Fridays in the same way anymore. I really felt like going out for a drink today, um, out for a drink, and that's just not possible, especially now that it's gotten chilly in Chicago. So um, I appreciate this company. Um, so my book, Like Love, is um, an essay collection that works like a memoir, but the individual pieces um, up, take a lot of different approaches to narrative. Um, and it's a collection that revolves around the theme of unconsummated romance. So I'm interested in crushes and infatuations and all of the interesting and odd ways that we come into um, momentary intimacies with other people, even and especially when um, we know that there's no future to that. So I'm going to read um, as much as I can in 10 minutes from an essay um, that is actually about a different kind of romance. It's the post-relationship romance. So it's about an ex. Um, and it's also, uh, there's a little bit of a spoiler alert here. I think I'll, will I tell you that? Um, no, I, I won't tell it. <laughs> I'll just read and see if it comes out in this part. And it, it, the title of this piece is How to Tell a True Love Story. So it's a bit of a play on Tim O'Brien's How to Tell a True War Story. And it's obviously in the second person. So I'll just check the time. Okay. Start with the time you both got drunk and slapped each other. So there, he said, palm smacking your cheek. So there, you retorted, whapping his forehead so hard he stumbled. It was two o'clock in the morning in a seaside town, the street lined with one bedroom cottages. He got up and smacked your cheek again, making your head snap to the side. You didn't try to stop him, just waited your turn and walloped his forehead. It went on like that until a dim face appeared in the window of the cottage you were standing in front of, and a young man's voice hissed, knock it off, through the screen. It's okay if that's not the way it happened, if the slapping wasn't really between you and him, but between you and your best teenage friend on summer vacation. The point here is to tell a good story, to catch the reader's attention straight away. So what if you never exchanged physical blows? Glowering can feel just as violent. Or maybe you should start with something edgier, something with a clearer angle. 
A friend of mine, a best-selling author, insists that if you're writing from personal experience, you have to have a big story. Like your father was a spy, or you climbed a snow-covered mountain and nearly died, or you witnessed a war. If your love story happened during wartime, just outside Baghdad's green zone, or better yet, in the coca fields of Colombia, you're golden. Unless it involves the Vietnam War, which is passe, done to death. If your love story happened in 1971, don't even bother. Something unique, that's what you've got to establish early on, that this love story is not like all the other love stories floating around in the world. But the problem with love stories is that they have only two outcomes, happiness or sadness. The love works out or the love does not, which is why you need the war or the mountain or the espionage, according to my friend. Late September, early evening, a cottage beside the Hudson River. There's a crowd of university people, hippie academics with guitars and hand-rolled cigarettes, and a beach covered with stones. Professor Wallace comes out in his swim trunks and t-shirt, his limbs pale and soft, and climbs into a kayak. You stand on the stones watching him paddle, everyone doubling over as the kayak shoots forward 20 feet before the waves carry him back again, over and over. Not far away stands the guy, a line floating in the plastic glass he holds aloft. You can do it, he shouts, one slim hip cocked. When you arrived at the, this party, wearing harem pants and a sleeveless turtleneck, his eyes had scanned in exactly the way you'd imagined while getting dressed. Now, as Professor Wallace paddles with everything he's got, guffawing as the oars splash water into his own face, you can feel the guy keeping an eye on you. Turn and walk up the stairs of the screened-in porch. Pop an oyster cracker into your mouth. Scrutinize the liquor table. In half a minute, the door will creak. Don't turn around. Stand there for a moment in this time just before dusk with the laughter and the splashing and the slap of waves and as an oil barge sends its wake to shore with the cool evening air skimming the salt from your neck and Billie Holiday singing about the awful things love will make you do. By the end of the night, he'll be drunk. You'll be drunk. Professor Wallace will be very drunk and singing Peggy Sue at the top of his lungs. The other professors will sing along and the grad students too, and this will seem like exactly the life you were made for. When the party is over, offer to give him a ride home. He'll grab two bottles of beer for the walk back to the car, along a path that leads through woods, through a meadow, over a stream to a grassy parking lot. You've had quite a lot to drink, but you take the beer anyway because, drunk or sober, you're the best driver you know. Before getting in the car, he takes hold of your elbow gently and turns you toward him. Listen, he says, seriously, can you get us home? You look up at the half moon casting its romantic light over the field. We'll see, you tell him, and he kisses you hard, as if to say you're worth the risk. Okay, that's good. A little sexual tension, a bit of danger from the drinking and driving. But you might ask, why not put the kiss somewhere else? Why not put it where it really happened two weeks after the party by the river, on the street in front of his house? And not a hard kiss at all, but a kiss so soft you could feel it for days. Because a true love story has to have a kiss early on, that's why. Otherwise, what's the purpose of the cabin on the river? Why leave poor Professor Wallace stuck out in that kayak for half an hour, damp t-shirt clinging to his skin? The kiss gets things going, sets the primary conflict in motion. Just be careful not to lose track of the bigger story, the angle, the hook. You drink because you like to drink. You like the taste of whiskey, the fuzzy tongue of it lip licking your lips. You like to feel your edges soften and hear words come out of your mouth in an order that sounds like insight. You like to feel convinced of all the potential that lies ahead. He drinks for a different reason, or maybe it's the same reason intensified. Beer, wine, whiskey, gin, he moves from one to the other in a single evening, trying to mitigate the stream of darkness that leaks from his cerebral cortex, drains along his spinal cord, pools in his small intestine. He has poison inside him, a persistent sense of worthlessness that alcohol dilutes. 
When he drinks, you soon discover he's a funnier, kinder, more entertaining version of himself. But be careful here. Don't get caught up in the alcohol because that angle has really been done. No one will care that he stopped drinking out of the blue, claiming to be an alcoholic, or that you didn't believe it, having known serious drunks in your life. Get over yourself, you said, ordering a maker's mark straight up. Straight up. Skip the months of depression, too. The dirty end of winter and tender spring, apple blossoms turning the air so thick it was sometimes hard to see while driving. Cut to Mother's Day, when he used a razor blade to make long, deep cuts in one arm. But that part's a drag to write, so don't linger. Does the world really need another description of blood on the floor, another emergency room scene with a social worker explaining a cry for help? Be advised. Your agent, real or imagined, won't like this. You're skirting the important part, he'll say. And even if you imagine, manage to convince him, there will be the editor, the marketing person, the aim to have it shelved somewhere lucrative. Grief and recovery, maybe, or self-help. They'll want you to keep thinking of the big story, the angle, the hook. But attempted suicide is not a hook, I can tell you. Who doesn't take too many pills once in a while? Who hasn't held a razor blade against their skin, drawn a little blood? It's not the attempt that matters, it's the result. And the result was something you never could have imagined. He lived and you fell in love. On that day in the emergency room, the thighs of his jeans stiff with blood, the disappointment in his eyes each time he looked at you, I can't even kill myself right, he'd scoffed. You didn't see the romance coming didn't understand how after intense drama, the heart circles its wagons, hunkers down, refuses to let go. You hadn't yet heard of the shaky bridge experiment in which male subjects were enlisted to walk across two suspension bridges in a forest. One bridge was sturdy and low to the ground while the other swayed hundreds of feet in the air with low rails and a genuine element of danger. After each subject crossed whichever bridge he'd been assigned, an attractive female member of the research team offered her phone number in case he had questions later about the experiment. The result? Guys who walked across the scary bridge were almost 50% more likely not just to call the woman, but to ask her out on a date. The emotional aftermath of danger often feels like romance. You'll want to use a scene to illustrate this, to capture the appeal of a guy who comes home from the hospital, still bandaged. But watch out for cliches, for sentimentality, for the stale confines of truth. In the lifespan of a fact, John Degada explains why he changed some details in an essay he'd written about a teenage boy's suicide in Las Vegas, including small insignificant details like the number of strip clubs in the city. There were 31 at the time of the suicide, and he made it 34 because, he says, the rhythm of 34 works better in that sentence than the rhythm of 31. Never mind that you can't hear the difference. Never mind the troubling idea that reality needs to be enhanced to make a good story. The story is what matters most. So play around with form and content. Give yourself permission. Do what you need to do. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, that was so engaging, and I loved um, the sort of uh, meta, metacritical nature of it, right? In, in the sense that we, not only, because not only is it that you're going back and looking at it to, to write an essay about an experience, you're also sort of talking about the way we build things in our memory to fit a certain narrative. Right. Um, because we do. And especially surrounding romance, I think romance and these really maybe um, uh, more difficult or strenuous uh, depression, you know, substance abuse, all these things, people tend to um, not want to believe that it's something that like, it's weird because simultaneously we want to believe it's completely unique and not like anything anyone else has ever felt. And at the same time, it's this grand mythical thing that has existed since the dawn of time and and i think owning that and just jumping back and forth between it and sort of pointing out um 
when you're, when you're moving things around and stuff is such a fascinating way to do it. Is this, um, is this sort of unique to this essay or is this something you do in other parts of the book? No, it's unique to this essay. Okay. Yeah. Because it's how to tell a love story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I also, uh, just some of the phrases in there are, are brilliant. And so, um, there was something in there about where you mentioned that you 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 liked you like to hear the words come out of your mouth and sound like insight, mm-hmm. and there was a little bit of me that was like, "Oh crap, that's what I do after people are done reading." It <laughs> <laughs> like, is what everyone does when we drink. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, pontificating, right? Kind of. <laughs> so that's uh, that's that's incredible, and I think just having um, you know, coming to the point of of. Uh, memoir obviously was I think it's gone through phases of popularity and especially around specific issues but especially like the grief and recovery thing you name checked in there uh and you know self-help substance abuse recovery that kind of stuff or mental health recovery um it is sort of well-trodden ground so it's it's fantastic that you were able to kind of hit this new angle of it which it sounds like to me the angle eventually was this stuff happened and yes you could focus on it you know he he harmed himself in some way. He had this experience. But I love that the, the thing you mentioned at the end was like, you couldn't believe a relationship would come out of this. Right. Like, because that's the part that nobody ever says. People like to cast it as like, it was this tragic love story and there was nothing we could do to avoid it. When mm-hmm. the reality of a situation like that might be more like, should I go? I don't know if it's okay for me to be here. <laughs> I think that's the way a lot of love stories begin. Hmm. with a lot of questioning about is this the right thing or should I head for the hills? Mm. I think that's, I think that's definitely true. So, all right. So the book is available. Uh, Noli just put a link to it in the chat from bookshop.org. So uh, I, I for one am very curious to read more of it. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Thank you. All right. Our next reader uh, is... Natalie Bacopoulos. She is the author of two novels, Scorpion Fish, Tin House 2020, and The Green Shore, Simon & Schuster 2012. Her work has appeared in Tin House, VQR, The Iowa Review, The New York Times, Granta, Plowshares, The Mississippi Review, O. Henry Prize Stories, and various other publications. She's an assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit. Natalie, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Here we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. There you go. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Ridge, for that intro. Um, thank you, Trina, for inviting me. Thank you, Joanna, for recommending me. And uh, Michelle and Courtney, those were great readings. I was, I was, I'm not used to the typing while people are reading. I was what, re- seeing it happening. I'm like, oh, I can say something too. So I was just so uh, immersed in what you were reading. I was just listening. So, um, but it was lovely. Um, Okay, so I'm going to read from, um, this is my um, new novel, Scorpion Fish. Um, it came out in July, and I'm going to read um, just the opening. So I don't need to tell you too much about it, but because you don't have it right in front of you, um, it's narrated, there's two narrators. One is a woman named Mira, who is um, Greek-American. Uh, she's come back to Athens after the death of her parents, and she's, um, uh, after the death of her parents, and she's um, kind of going back to their uh, old apartment that she was born in and, and lived in until she was five. Um, and the second narrator, I won't read from him tonight, but he's a ship captain who's no longer um, at sea, and he's living next door to her. Um, and the two of them begin having conversations out on their balconies. But I'll just read from the opening, uh, the first few pages. Um, and this is Mira, the narrator. The small two-bedroom flat where I lived until I was five is on the northern slip of Mount Ligavitos, between the neighborhoods of Ambilokopi and Neapoli. Back in Athens, for the first time since my parents' funeral a few months earlier, my arrival felt both unreal and more real than anything I might have imagined, as though my porous, jet-lagged self had emptied itself into this space. Aris was working in Brussels for the week, and though I still could have gone straight to his place, I didn't. Though I'd planned to live with him, I had to spend some time cleaning cleaning out my parents' flat before I'd rent it out. When I'd come for the funeral, I couldn't bring myself to go near it. I expected Aris to object to all this, but instead he'd only asked, you sure you want to be alone there? I told him I'd be fine, but really, I wasn't sure. 
In fact, it had been so long since I'd been to this apartment that when the cab driver hoisted my bags out of the trunk, he must have noticed my disorientation because he asked, is this the right place? I told him yes, but hesitantly. Then I recognized the flat on the ground floor, which as when I was a child had its shutters open to the street. You could have jumped right in from the sidewalk. I held my jumble of keys like a lantern. It was growing dark, and for whatever reason, crisis, negligence, all the streetlights were out. The key to the apartment itself, a big old style safety key was obvious, but I couldn't seem to locate the one for the building door. The others were for Aris's place, the house on the island, and who knows where else. A light went on inside and a tall man, perhaps in his early fifties, wearing headphones and running clothes came down the staircase. He opened the door for me. I thanked him, acting as if my hands were simply full. Noticing he helped me haul my suitcase up the first few stairs from the foyer to the elevator on the first floor. Even now, I remember the soapy smell of the rhododendrons by the mailboxes, the hint of his grapefruit cologne. I followed him, then stopped at the foot of the marble stairs. He, whom I'd later know as the captain, placed my bags in the elevator and asked me which floor. I told him the third, and a look of surprise crossed his face. Oh, he said, we're neighbors. How had he seen me upon this initial meeting? How had I seen him? I struggled to remember how many of the details I had truly noticed or have simply inserted now. We must have spoken in Greek, though later we'd use English as well. Did I hear the thin music from his headphones? I recall something I had until now forgotten. In that first interaction, I felt a flash of recognition, of some silent acknowledgement, a feeling of both surprise and inevitability. I thanked him and when he left, I sent the suitcases up, the elevator too small for both me and the bags, and took the stairs. Everything looked smaller than I remembered, but walking up those strange yet familiar flights engaged some sort of homing instinct. As if my arms were moved by some force outside myself, I turned the clunky safety key in the lock and pushed open the door. Forgetting that my mother had begun remodeling before she died and that it had looked different even before then, I had expected the apartment of my youth. There was still the airy living room, those high ceilings, the honey-colored parquet floors. A new coat of paint, a soft beige accented with white crown molding, sheer curtains over the glass doors to the balconies, new shutters. Once closed in and rather dark, the kitchen had be done, been redone in a more contemporary style as a pass through with stools and a serving bar opening up to the dining room. The cabinets were new, white and shiny, and there were new butcher block countertops. I remembered more paintings and photographs on the walls, but now only two things remained, a frame print of the entire Divine Comedy, all 100 cantos printed in tiny, barely, le barely legible font, and a large paintings of Nefeli's. The piece, one from a series of variations on an old church near the sea, had once hung in our dining room in Chicago and now hung here over the dining room table. The last time my parents came to Greece, they brought it back with them. The large door of the church was open and in the doorway stood a woman with a dark mane of hair, her back to the viewer, almost unnoticeable, blending into darkness. From afar, it looked like a painting of a church and nothing more. Sometimes I imagined the girl moving. At one point, I had convinced myself that she appeared only to me. Despite my annual visits, I hadn't been back to the apartment since my father's older sister, Harula, was arrive and alive and living there. Over the past seven years, I'd always stay with my boyfriend, Aris. After Harula passed, my parents rented the place. They primarily came only the summers and preferred to stay on the island where my mother was born. But last summer, perhaps in anticipation of spending her golden years moving between the island and Athens, my mother began to renovate as if making these improvements would convince my father to return them to Greece. To her, assimilation was equivalent to death. I called Aris in Brussels to let him know I'd gotten in safely. He apologized again for not being there. He asked about the apartment and I told him about the new kitchen, the fresh paint on the walls, the simple furniture. He seemed relieved. As we are hanging up, he blurted, hang in there, which I might have taken as strange had I not still been mourning my parents. His familiar voice soothed me, though it felt thick with a sadness I attributed, at the time, to the wrong thing. Few reminders of my parents remained. There was the record player, a smaller version of the one in Chicago, and several end tables. 
but below the bathroom sink, I found a collection of mostly empty liquor bottles, my mother's cashed out arsenal. I picked one up, unscrewed the metal cap, smelled the thin trace of vodka. I turned around quickly, feeling as though she were watching me. My mother, always the subtext. I moved through my old apartment as though I could walk through walls, my past and present and future selves all negotiating the same space, bumping shoulders, tripping over feet. The closets were nearly empty, except for a few storage bins. I was surprised to find papers and notes from when I had been a graduate student in ethnography, taking oral histories, talking to the inhabitants of the island who lived through the Nazi occupation, through the dictatorship. It's how I first met Aris's father, the novelist, then Aris himself. That first meeting with Aris and what came after, that's the love story most would want to hear. Thank you. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Uh, I really got from that. Thank you. Uh, the tremendous sense of, it's a cliche, right? But, but the, the sort of you can't go home again feeling of, of places you've been in the past and you associate with specific people. And then when you get there, I think that you had a line in there about um, your past, present, and future selves, or her past, present, future selves, all colliding with each other, trying to negotiate this space. And that's such like a, that's such a um, relatable experience, for lack of a better term. And a lot of the details you chose early on, just like instantly, you know, took me right there. I love, I love when people describe you know, especially smells. I don't know why. It just really works. <laughs> um, I've never been to Greece, but it works, you know? Uh, so that's that's awesome. And I think you you ended at a perfect place for us to, it was almost like a like a teaser because now we got to find out what happened. Um, so the book is available now? The book's available now, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I think... Um, Thank you for those nice comments. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, that's, I mean, this is, uh, this. we are a... Uh, mutual admiration society here but i really uh i'm i'm very curious to find out find out more about what happens to these two and i think also uh just how do i put this i think um maybe it's a generational thing or or a thing of age or something but you know as adults we find ourselves in this weird middle spot where you know parents may be passing away, you know people are slipping away slowly, and there's sort of this really strange, stark feeling that I don't know if I don't really know if you brought it or if I projected it, but I'm going to go for it, um, which is this feeling of like, oh no, I'm the only one here now. I'm the one who has to figure out what the heck to do. And I'm the one who has to, you know, take care of the realities of cleaning out an apartment, um, dealing with bank account, whatever it is. There is a very strange um, moment in life where you kind of realize you are the tip of your family's spear. Mm -hmm. And what I think I got from that is the moment of familiarity, but sheer alien weirdness of letting, you know, her letting herself into the apartment where her parents lived and now are no longer there sort of is that moment in a way. Um, I might again be, uh, intensely massively projecting, but, <laughs> but at the same time, I think it's still in there. So I think, I think it's really fascinating to, to have that juxtaposed with romance and, and sort of senses of home and stuff. So I'm, I'm really curious to, uh, to read the rest of the story. Thank you. I love that reading and, and that's a great projection, but I, yeah, I'm definitely thinking of the moment when we realize we're middle-aged that instead mm -hmm. of our parents being middle-aged, we're the middle-aged ones and our parents mm -hmm. are, are not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Anyway, well, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I think Noli posted a link to the book as well. So people go, go uh, pick one of those up. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. All right. I'm going to try to try to keep moving. I like, I get really like, I start the show. I'm always tired. It's Friday afternoon. And then I'm like, I start getting fired up and the wheels start spinning. And then if I don't watch it, I talk way too much. So I'm just going to we'll move along. Um, our next reader is Karen Newberg. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Glassworks, Gone Lawn, Really System, Unbroken and Verse Daily. She's the author of Pursuit, Kelsey Books, 2019, and the chat book, 
The Elephants Are Asking, Glass Liar Press, 2018. She holds an MFA from the New School and is associate editor of the online journal First Literary Review East. She lives and writes in Brooklyn, New York. And we will post a link to her website in the chat. And Karen, you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, I muted you again. I'm sorry. I pushed it after you did. There you go. I, mis I misunderstood that. Uh, oh, no, no. That was me. I muted you after you unmuted. I'm sorry. Take it away. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Those were wonderful readings. And I think Kai is reading after. So I'm looking forward to that. And thank you, Ridge and Trina. And I think Noli also, that you're involved in this in a big way. This is a great series. So I'm going to read a few poems. Um, and I'll start with a prose poem. It's called The Story of My Story. Over time, some of the pages have gone missing. They fly in the wind and sometimes land at my feet. Too often I inadvertently step on them and keep going or rain plasters them to my window. The ink runs. Sometimes I see my story in the mirror, crooked teeth, gray brows. I run my story down a page. It weeps a new sorrow than it used to, picks the lint of loss, fluffs it into a pillow. I sleep on my story. I sleep in it. It sleeps in me. It buries itself in me. My story has become quiet has become mystery. I have to beg it to share itself, to share those exciting bits that had me hanging by my fingertips over ledges of want, over desire, over my adventures of accumulation and achievements and failures, of walks by the frozen lakes and weaving through crowded streets. There are a million trees in my story and a million lights seen in houses and apartments. My story has become the impression of all that has happened more than what has actually happened. It doesn't seem to mind, so why should I? But somehow I do. And this is uh, another prose poem, it's called After. After heading out, I was only interested in a next I couldn't envision but wanted. There was a fog I had to pass through, a wall with pictographs I couldn't decipher, a darkness I avoided. A book caught me in the rye. I didn't turn down any corner. When I couldn't undo the lengthening tether, I tore it in two. My half trailed almost to the ground. Later, I used it to make a lariat to catch what was left of what I had left drag it all back. A girl I barely knew came with it. And this is called All My Shoes Are Dancing Shoes, All My Shadows Lead Home. Elongated as if being pulled, my shadow merges with the shadow of the tree leaning in the direction of my destination as sun behind keeps lowering until our single shadow is swallowed into dark's glow. And then my swift red shoes, my red dancing shoes dance across the distance to my home, its door ajar, supper on the table and there waiting, the one who always smiles on my return. This is called Summer Light, um, and it's a poem about my childhood. It could also be called Family Life, I guess. Summer Light. I dream of the light in our summer rooms and the way the rooms called us into their cupped palms, light emanating into a quiet that kept me wanting. I dream I knew then words that could have taken us into the things as I wanted them but I couldn't even envision what that was. I didn't have the words, only an abundance of summer light gently enveloping us so together, yet so separate, so private. And this is very new, it's called procrastination. I should just get to it. 
circumvent the waiting around for it to happen as though it will come on tiptoes in soft slippers carrying every childhood birthday cake and my first set of wheels and the easy wee of roller skating down an incline. Instead, I should just sleep in. Here again, the yell I heard the first time I jumped off the high diving board and realized the cry came from deep within myself. And I'm only reading one poem from one of my books. I'm, this is um, The Elephants Are Asking, which is um, a cry to let's do something about the environment. Um, and this poem is called Information. I see another speckle, uh, I'm sorry. I see another spectacle blocking my view, another fad slipping into my bed. The cave walls are filled with conflicting shadows demanding attention in urgent and dazzling tones. How small respect has become if it's our eyes like drones while entertainment pumps up our need to be amused. I feel strings attaching to my heart, tugging me away from what I used to know. I'm diverted by a spin of words that cover over and are covered by. Pack of lies, pack of truths, information pours and pours, burying us beneath ourselves. And this is the final poem. The title is also the first line. And the title comes from combining lines by the poet Edward Hirsch, Hirsch and Pope Gregory I. I wasn't going to lay down on my side and face away from fetid smoke coming out of the liar's mouth. But here in the park, amid vendors selling resist buttons, all was a mellow tranquil. Graduates in purple gowns, everyone enjoying the first sunny day in a week. A shirtless young man displaying a pleasant torso. I swear I got it. The simple pleasure of doing nothing, the benefit of sitting back and relaxing, even while hoping it's not going to be too late to do something after. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much. Uh, and Wow, that's really powerful. Um, your work is, uh, I, I may lack a adequate vocabulary to respond to <laughs> poetry sometimes. What I wanna say, especially about the prose poems, the first couple is there's, there's sort of an understated power there of like, it's very factual, just very descriptive, but there's this like undercurrent of truth beneath that, you know, that, that really just sort of pulled at me and I, I absolutely loved. Um, and particularly just moving forward, uh, the poem, that poem about information and, and the sort of way that we are swamped with um, unpleasantly distracting gibberish, if we let ourselves be. Um, I just thought you captured that perfectly. And, and I really appreciated the sense of um, taking a stark look at sort of where we are, but it, it doesn't in, at least, especially in your presentation, it doesn't feel judgmental or, or condemning or anything. It's just, this is what's happening right now. And that alone is enough to sort of change my mind about it. So I think that was um, really powerful. So uh, again, as I've been asking everybody, I guess the book's available currently. Yes. And, I think Noli, yep, there we go. Noli just pasted it so you can um Thank you. You can follow Karen on Instagram, find her on Twitter, and get the book as well. Um and just again, thank you so much for for coming and sharing that with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you thank you for your comments. I appreciate them. Glad my only endeavor is to make people feel heard if I can. So I, I'm happy to do it. Um our final reader tonight is Kai Coggin. She is the author of three full-length poetry collections, Periscope Heart, Swimming with Elephants, 2014, Wingspan, Golden Dragonfly Press, 2016, and Incandescent, Sibling Rivalry Press, 2019, as well as a spoken word album, Silhouette, from 2017. She's a queer woman of color who thinks Black Lives Matter 
a teacher teaching artist in poetry with the Arkansas Outs. Oh my gosh, pardon me, Arkansas Arts Council, and the host of the longest running consecutive weekly open mic series in the country, Wednesday Night Poetry. Recently named Best Poet in Arkansas by the Arkansas Times, her fierce and powerful poetry has been nominated three times for the Pushcart Prize, as well as Bettering American Poetry 2015 and Best of the Net 2016 and 2018. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Cultural Weekly, Entropy, Nell, Sinister Wisdom, Calamus Journal, Lavender Review, Luna Luna, Blue Heron Review, Yes, Poetry, and Elsewhere. Uh, Coggin is the associate editor of the Rise Up Review, and she lives with her wife and two adorable dogs in the valley of a small mountain in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Oh, you, there we go. So, Kai, you should be able to unmute yourself and take us away. Thank you so much, Ridge. I know that that uh, bio is quite a mouthful, so you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Trina, for inviting me, and Noli, and everybody that is uh, affiliated with TGI. Thank you, Marissa Glover. Shout out to you, and shout out to Deidre um, for nominating me to be here. And all the readers tonight, Karen, Natalie, Michelle, um, and Courtney, the, your readings were beautiful, and I feel that all of our work is interwoven somehow in the way that we all shared, and hopefully my work is going to uh, also speak to your beautiful work. And so I'm honored to, to share this space with you tonight. October is LGBT History Month. And so I'm going to start with a poem from Incandescent that is about the first time I kissed a girl. And it's called Her. I might have been 10 when I realized the magnets inside me were spinning toward her. Whoever her was, she was my everything, my longing to be seen, my ache to be touched, my dream to be kissed by, missed by her. Whoever her was, she was my love, and I could not help but be enamored. The feelings did not die down. They grew into silent flowers in my chest until a meadow sprung from my mouth when I spoke, until petals only saying, she loves me, she loves me, she loves me, spilled from my lips and became my words. At that age, I did not have the word gay, did not have the word lesbian, the word queer, just this fear to explain my frame of, to explain my frame of reference around my undeniable attraction to her. There was always a her through the years of my youth, a too far face I could fix my eyes and heart upon, like a star guiding me out of my black hole secret, never close enough to touch, never close enough to whisper, never close enough to be real in my arms. I was taught those fires would burn me forever, and sin was named after a woman, but I wanted her skin on my mouth so much. The first time I kissed a girl at 17, I might have been a fault line the way I trembled, the way the earth moved around all our fresh bodies. I remember her wild curls falling across my face, the way she laughed, the taste of her yes, the ceiling fan spinning rings over our heads, and I may have never returned to the earth that day the way she sent me hovering into the atmosphere with only the fear that this moment might not be real. And these kisses and her cheek and her neck and her shoulder and her and her and her moving up so close to the wild magnet of me might just be a fleeting dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was her. It was love, real love, my first love, and her name stays with me, folded into my skin, and I can remember her in poems and be right there again. Two budding young flowers, how the memories linger after 20 years, how we open to each other's fingers, and she is married now, has two beautiful children. We don't speak, and I like to think it is because there is still a part of her that remembers how I trembled 
and to no fault of hers or mine, love sometimes makes strangers out of lovers. But I can write her into a poem and thank her always for being real. Thank you so much. Yay, gays. Uh, all month, all year, every day, I'm here, I'm queer. <laughs> um, okay. So there's a big elephant in the room. Um, I don't come into a space uh, because I believe in using my voice and um, I use my voice to speak for the marginalized and for the oppressed and myself as a brown queer woman living in America 2020. I do not go into a space without saying how I feel about this administration. And today was a very interesting day in our history for sure. And um, we all know what happened with Trump today. I wrote this poem um, about three weeks ago and I had gotten to this point where the news, as Karen was mentioning, the news was just so inundating and I had gotten to a point where I, I just couldn't take any more. And um, I wrote a poem and it's called, This America, How Much More Can We Take? It's a constant painful inundation to be alive in this America, this America, as if I have detached myself from my country, as if I am removed from its borders, outsider trapped inside, warrior of light with nowhere to hide, how much more can we take? This America, its spacious skies choked with the ash of a million acres burning. Climate change deniers keep the fires raging higher. Everything tinder, everything silver cinders and smoke. Black out the sun with the arms of falling redwoods. Ancients collapsing with the weight of humanity's collective disregard. How much more can we take? This America. It's amber waves and waves of pain. Every day, a new horror. Every day, a new shame. Another slashing of our human dignity by the hands of the heartless minority in stolen power. A regime that viciously stamps out American dreams and builds walls of broken glass and silenced screams, brandishing weapons of fear and hate and terror with teens, with AR-15s, turns our stars into swastikas in the bright of day. This is America 2020, and I cannot look away. He turns the people's house white, 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 holds an authoritarian ego convention on the sacred steps with floodlights, blinding out the darkness he created as savior for the radical right. How much more can we take this America? From sea to once shining sea, we are a sick country, quarantined, suffocating in a public health emergency. Our passports no good for travel internationally because we have no handle on this ravaging disease. 300,000 will die before the end of the year. The world laughs at our dictator in chief as he says what a very good job he did. The very best ever job he did. Better than humanly possible in every other fucking superlative. The most robust testing, lie. It will just disappear like a miracle, lie. China virus, China virus, China virus, racism. I provided the most ventilators and PPE. Lie. Cases are going up because testing is going up. Gaslighting. Maybe try drinking some bleach. Jesus fucking Christ. Hydroxychloroquine. Oh, please. I will have the best vaccine really quickly. Lie. Children are virtually immune. Lie. And we send in the teachers to die for the economy, how much more can we take? This America, 
its purple mountain majesties turn bloody bruises, turn tear gas and rubber bullet blush, turned crush under the foot of brutality's boot, knee on his pleading throat, George. Shot seven times in the back in front of his children, Jacob. These men, these black men, these black fathers whose martyrdom is unfounded, unfound fathers lost to their existences, holes in their former lives to teach us a lesson that keeps repeating and repeating, you cannot be black in this America and survive. You cannot be sleeping like Breonna Taylor and stay alive. Hashtag stitched up to the stars like barbed wire and we have fenced ourselves in with all our collective history and hate to look at each other in the face until each side screams for a civil war in this America. I just can't take anymore. I just can't take it anymore. Anyone with a heart in their chest, a pulse in their striving soul, a light inside that guides them can see us, all of us, spiraling out of control. How much more can we take? How do we save our principles? How do we build upon real foundations while there are monsters tearing at the roots? How do we save our democracy, our liberties, our virtues? How do we taste hope on our lips again? Vanquish the oligarch and his mob of evil men. Open your heart even wider, though it may be broken. Tell truth to power, though your voice might be shaking. Embolden justice, progress, inclusiveness, brotherhood, empathy, and light. This is still our America. This is still our America. And we are still in this fight. Thank you. Okay, who? Thank you everybody for hearing that, for receiving that. I wish I could hear you guys cheering or, you know, yelling about Trump at me or whatever, but like, shit, I'm shaking, man. And that, that just means that that energy was received. And this is a room full of open hearts. And thank you for giving me that space to share that. And Ridge, I know earlier you said it, you didn't like things that maybe sounded not preachy, I don't remember the word you used, but that was meant to be preachy. That was meant to like, you know, stand up and be righteous and remember who the fuck we are. Like we don't, this, we don't have to settle for this. And the only thing that we can do is vote. The only thing that we can do, even though people are gonna try to stop it and who knows what we're gonna be in tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like what's, what's tomorrow's story going to be? So we're all just kind of holding our breath, seeing what happens with, with Trump having COVID. But I mean, follow the laws of nature, you know, he may, he may not have to obey American laws, but natural law always wins. And my wife said that today. And I was like, that's, that's brilliant. Natural law wins, you know, and if you don't listen to the science, blah, 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 I'm going to get off that high horse. Okay. <laughs> we all know. So I'm going to not leave us in that space because we've been in that space, you know, for way too long. Um, I'm gonna leave us with, with a love poem. Uh, in July, I got to marry the love of my life, Joanne. We've been together for 12 years and uh, we got married outside in our garden on Zoom, just like this. And uh, I've just been still kind of floating on this cloud because I've thought of all the hundreds of poems that I've written for her where I called her my love or my dear one or you know all these other names. But now I get to call her my wife when I write a poem. So. This is called Filling Spice Jars as Your Wife. It seems like all my poems after this will be different. They will hold a different weight, like how the weight of my heart has shifted into ing indistinguishable float, into lifting cloud, into weightless flight tonight as the rain gently falls on the summer-heated tin roof. 
the din of casual raindrops and warm low lights glowing and wind blowing through the house. We have all our doors and windows open. We have all our doors and windows open and I am pouring spices into glass jars, coriander, cinnamon, cumin, ground sage, and it's hard to describe this moment within the confines of a page, tiny hills of vibrant color and intoxicating fragrance. And you hear the cadence of my heart from the kitchen where you build the perfect fitting slip in shelves for our spices over the stove. Match the colors, match my colors to yours. I have all my doors and windows open to you. I have all my doors and windows open to you and you have come all the way inside, sat down at the table of my deepest desires and lit a fire to warm us both. The wind blowing through the house, the rain gently giving way to turmeric sunrise. And you, darling, you are my wife. You are my wife. And it's like I have been waiting my whole life to say those words. And I feel held in a way I have never felt before. To look down at my fingers, dusted with ginger and thyme, and see the gold of my wedding band glint and shine in the warm low light glow. I am yours and you are mine. Promised in front of a garden of giant zinnia and hummingbird vines, sung out in the morning song of bluebirds, this union that ripples out love to the world and infinities back into us again, love in the fine powder of these spices ground up essence of oregano and basil. I see our love in every atom suddenly and every cell in me finally exhales. And perhaps that is the wind. Perhaps that is the wind blowing through the house, this release of eternal searching and finding you there, calling me your forever, naming me your always, to have and to hold till death do we part and start all over again looking only for each other's hearts taking my life in your hands eternal marrying me to the heavens latching me to the star trail of your white dress in this orbital dance this lift and spin this knowing from within that all my poems after this will be different because you are my wife. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, Kai, thank you so much. Uh, I think um, every once in a while, I have to react this way. I'll just say, holy shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the range, first of all, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, um, such a wonderful note to end on and such a, such a, you know, this is something I've spoken about in my personal life quite a lot is we tend, it's very easy to take things like marriage or, or relationships for granted. Right. And, right. and I think particularly probably well, I'm guessing, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm guessing that the experience of someone who has not always legally been allowed to be married, uh, you know, you get to appreciate the significance uh, in a, in a, full way if you take yeah, you know, absolutely when you're able to take that step um and i think just the description of it and the description of something um the setting of filling a spice rack is like so uh mundane but simultaneously yeah. such a massive symbol of home totally and she was literally building it like build you know building it on the <laughs> wall and i'm pouring the spices and i was just like god this is such a poem and i'm sure yeah. everyone you can relate when you just see a poem kind of unfolding in front of you. And then I just thought it's different now because she's my wife now, you know, mm -hmm. even though we've been together forever, mm -hmm. um, it's, just, it's just different, you know, and, and what gives me the fire to read my political poems is, is, is the fear that, you know, some of these rights that, that I have, that we finally have, you know, could be overturned or could be mm -hmm. taken away from us. And I'm, I'm just not going to be silent at all. And I sure. don't think any of us should when given a position of power or, or a platform to speak from. And so mm -hmm. 
as a host, uh, Ridge, you know, we're listening for your comments because you speak for everyone in the Zoom, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I take that work also very responsibly as, as the host of Wednesday Night Poetry. We, we as artists, especially in this time of such darkness, we, we direct thought. We direct thought. Art, people go to art. What do we have to do right now besides watch movies and read books and look at art and listen to music? You know, we're stuck in our houses and we're in these poetry readings. We, we are directing thoughts. So we definitely have a responsibility. And if you can wield that sword, you know, now's the time to fucking wield it. Mm, certainly. And, and just by the way, I, I don't recall the comment about not wanting to be preachy. I don't remember oh, what I said, I don't remember but, what it was. Uh, but it's okay. I, I wouldn't, yeah. the thing is for myself, I don't want to preach about anything. And I always say on the show, I am okay with disagreeing with people about anything except human rights. And uh, as people who've been here before have probably heard me say, we have this idiotic preoccupation in America that human rights only happens overseas. Right. In the developing exactly. world. That's where human rights issues happen. Here in America, we have, you know, identity politics or what we talk about it in a very different way. And we pretend that it is not the same. And it is a hundred percent the same. And I think um what I liked a lot about your poem is, is the combination, the, the one particularly about America, is the, this combination of these high-flung ideals with um, this materialistic, uh, heartless structure that, that has sprung up through it. You know, like these high-flung ideals that it's basically what, it, what I've been thinking is what really annoys me lately is the death of hypocrisy as an idea. It just mm. nobody cares anymore. Right. And it's, I, I still really care. I try really hard to be a decent person. I like that about myself. I try very hard to educate myself and, and do things like tell people, you know, if I screw up with pronouns or with language, please just go ahead and correct me. And like, I, I want to um, do as well as I possibly can so that other people aren't further marginalized or harmed and that's just on a language level let alone on the structural systemic level right um and then the other thing and this is just a random observation doesn't really have anything to do with anything <laughs> but how can we have a man who is such a profound narcissist that all of us 380 or whatever million people spend all day talking about his ego right his sense of self half of them or 40 percent, whatever protecting it and the rest attacking it what's going on why do we want a king so badly with the supreme court why do we demand a council of elders what happened to democracy this is all the things that go on in my head all day but oh, i'm really yep. glad you know that you shared with us what goes on in your head when you look at this country well, in the direction that it's been going because thankfully i don't allow him too much of that real estate you know oh, yes. um, and I, <laughs> but when it comes out it comes out in one sitting and it's usually pretty fiery like that um, yeah that's good. But, you know, it was a it was a weird. I had a moral conflict all day of like, well, should I read that poem? Because you know, but if speaking about hypocrisy, you know, if the tables were turned, we all know what would happen. You know, so yeah. I think it's important to to highlight all those issues. Like Karen brought up climate change and you mm. know Black Lives Matter and all the things that are so much in the forefront, especially for people of color. You know, and and queer people and you know trans people, all of us that are not cis white hetero male you know so uh, thank you again for giving that space i'm sorry i mean sorry not sorry to like take it into that sphere but i think it's unavoidable right now we're, we're within a month of, of a very important election the most important election of, of all of our lifetimes and so i don't know if it came across as cheesy or whatever but the end of that poem was an ekphrastic you know so that's why i was like <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that came across no i thought it was great i mean <laughs> okay. i think and I think you're right. Like this is the time when th this is the time to take those opportunities. And yeah. so I'm, I'm happy we were able to provide that for you. Um, thank you so much again for, I'm for honored. coming. Thank and, you for having me. Uh, and everybody check out uh, Kai's work. We, there were links posted in the chat and then the Wednesday night reading series is happening online as well. Right. It's on Facebook every week and it's oh, called awesome. Wednesday, Wednesday night poetry. And this week is 1,654 weeks in a row wow. that we've had. When, yeah. So we've been doing it kind of a long time. I've done 30 virtual volumes every mm -hmm. week since March. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a long, long thing. So I couldn't let the legacy 
die down when it was in my hands. And so uh, we're, we're going, we're there every Wednesday, check out Wednesday night poetry or friend me on Facebook. That's awesome. All right. Thank you. Go check that out. I'm going to wrap up the show. And then just so folks know, um, we don't need to close the room immediately and I can allow people to unmute themselves once again. So if you'd like to hang out, chat, react to people who read their work or network, network. I don't know what that means, but that's fine. Uh, you can do so. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I know a few people hopped off because we ran a little bit over, but I don't mind at all. I don't think anybody does. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the show, you can go to tgicast.com or you can find us on Twitter at tgicast. You can find me on Twitter at Ridge Cresswell. The show's creator, I'm going to point to where she is relative to my box on my screen. The show's creator, Trina Thibodeau on Twitter at Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. And the show's uh, Booker, but I refer to her as the executive vice president of talent relations, Noli Reed, uh, on Twitter at Noli Reed. Um, thank you guys all so much. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, stay safe. Take care of yourselves and uh, we will be here every week until probably we just change days once we're allowed to go outside again. No reason to stop. Well, I'm going to hit stop. <laughs>